So I'm, I'm Jeremy. Uh, so I work at Mila. I'm an uh, applied research scientist there. I have a background in engineering physics. Uh, and then in the last few years, I've really been focused a lot more on everything machine learning and deep learning related. So Mila itself is a research institute that really focuses primarily on anything deep learning. Uh, so it's really like a artificial intelligence research institute but I would say 95% of what goes on there is probably deep learning based. How I was introduced to this project, Yael had contacted me. Hi everyone. Uh, if I can just uh, say a little something to talk about the clinical implications before Jeremy gets into the, the heavy uh, AI stuff. So what we were trying to do is trying to create a tool for transgender patient for uh, gender recognition of the voice in the clinical setting. Uh, after treatment uh, for transgender um, surgery. So that's kind of our uh, clinical standpoint, and that's the, the reason we started working uh, working with them. So Jeremy's going to go into the the heavy explanations here, and uh, if anybody has any clinical questions related to that knowledge, I'm happy to answer as well. Thank you, Jeremy. It's called uh, Voice and Deeds. So the objective of the project is to build a so an AI-based tool to differentiate between male and female voices. And the context is to be used to evaluate the uh, success of voice therapy in an objective and quantitative way uh, for the transgender population. So Yael has sort of briefly mentioned what the problem statement is about, and she could probably give more information as to um, like some, some more of the details. I'm going to go more into the technical side of what it is that we're building to actually have some quantitative measures. Uh, to give a bit of background, uh, there's not really any good objective outcome measurements in terms of uh, success for uh, the, when, when someone goes through the uh, changing of voice in the transgender population. So uh, there's a lot of subjective uh, measurements. And uh, this is where I'm not an expert, but if I understood correctly, people sort of evaluate uh, how they think they sound compared to, and they have all sorts of tests. Um, and there's also other measures that will use uh, various um, uh, various uh, parameters from the recordings. Uh, but what we kind of want is just have an end-to-end -to -end tool that takes an audio clip and gives a quantitative number that says, how confident is this prediction that the sound clip that we listened to was male or female? And so the clinical implication of all this is that um, if we have enough data, so we record a bunch of people, say typical male voices, typical female voices, and we train a system to identify between male and female voices, then if we know that that system is robust on male and female voices, when someone goes through a change of voice, they can then measure quantitatively, like how does this system think compared to all the voices it's seen in the past that this person ranks in terms of a male voice or a female voice. Uh, so we're, the data set that we're working with is a, a curated data set that Yael has obtained for us. Uh, so we have approximately 300 voice recordings. And they're all of high quality. Uh, they're done uh, in a lab, lab environment where people are asked to uh, talk in a, a specific script. And there's all sorts of, uh, of different cues. And they, they, they'll sweep their voice, like going, uh, and different things like that, so we can kind of hear uh, the, all the different um, sound qualities of their voice in the audio file. And each sample is approximately 30 seconds long, but that kind of depends on uh, where it was recorded. Uh, so the gender breakdown that we have in this data set, it's slightly unbalanced, so we have more female voices than we have male voices. Um, and also one thing to note is that it's not a particularly big data set. It's 300 voice recordings. And uh, in the context of training deep learning models, usually you want in the thousands or millions of examples. Uh, but we'll address how we kind of uh, overcome this. So the high level approach, uh, what we're doing is we're doing supervised learning uh, using CNN. So CNN stands for convolutional neural networks on voice spectrograms. So what that means is we start with our voice file. Um, actually, I have a loaded voice file here, but you won't hear it if I click play because I'm going through headphones, so I won't actually play it. Um, but this is a sound file that you can open on your computer. What we do is we feed it through a uh, uh, speech recognition library. Uh, in this case, just as a detail, we use Librosa, but there are 
a few different libraries that can uh, that can go from sound file to spectrum. So we convert this sound file into a representation that's uh, two dimensional. And what we have in the spectrum is we can think of this axis as time and this axis as frequency. And the color here is the intensity of these frequencies. So as people are talking, the various frequencies that they emit. Um, and what we then do is we take this spectrogram and we feed it as an input into our convolutional neural network. So here we're using the PyTorch framework and uh, we have a whole training pipeline set up. And the idea is that once we feed this through our uh, convolutional neural networks, we can then get our prediction of the percentage uh, confidence of it being a male or it being a female. So diving in a bit more into the details of our implementation, what we decided to do uh, is, oh, so maybe I could speak a bit more about the spectrograms. So the spectrograms themselves, uh, I mentioned this already, we use Librosa. It's an open source library that allows us to generate these power spectrums. And uh, there's actually quite a lot of parameters that we can play with. Uh, so I invite you to go read the documentation or maybe talk to me afterwards if you'd like to know a bit more about these parameters. But some of these parameters are the hop size, the window length, uh, how many mel bands do we want here. So when we're sampling and taking a slice of a spectrogram, how much of the voice are we actually including? And a lot of these parameters can actually impact how these, what these spectrograms look like. So during training, what we do is instead of in giving the entire spectrogram, so this entire spectrogram might represent approximately 30 seconds of sound, what we do is we'll, we'll take a random slice out of it. Uh, and so every time we iterate through the data set, we'll take slices at random. And to this slice, we always know that this whole spectrum is associated to the same gender. So particularly here, we take a slice of 256 by 80, uh, and these are just uh, implementation details. So this can be thought of as an uh, input matrix or an input image, if you will, to our CNN, because CNNs are typically used with images. So we take a slice and then we'll feed that through our network. Then we can take another slice and feed that through our network. And um, the reason why we do that is this is how we sort of augment our data set. So we only have 300 of these spectrums, but from these 300 spectrums, we can sample many, many different slices like this. And they'll very rarely overlap or be the, ex uh, not overlap, but they'll very rarely be the exact same slice. So it'll just, it's kind of a trick that we use to uh, augment how much data we're actually giving to our network. And it also makes it, uh, makes these models a lot smaller, smaller and easier to train. And it makes it such that we can then evaluate on the entirety of the network. So while we're training, we only go one slice at a time. Oh, and this is another detail that I should add, that we are uh, accounting for the disproportion in male to female in this data set. Um, so while we're training, we're going one slice at a time. But when we're validating and testing our system, what we do is we then take all the different slices that we can take and uh, take the average mean prediction on all these slices. So during training, we're just saying, here's one slice, give the proper prediction. But then when we're evaluating, we're actually going to go and sweep the entire spectrum and say, for this patient that's never been seen before, for all of these different slices, here's my prediction, and then take a mean of this prediction, and hopefully the majority vote is the actual gender that we're trying to look for. I see, yeah. you know, the left side of the spectrogram looks like speech, and the right side looks like uh, a vowel or constant phonation on a pitch. It really doesn't matter to your machine that the tasks are widely varied. No, nope. in this case, uh, we're trying to generalize across all the spectrums. Uh, which is also kind of the, the strength of this approach, is the more varied data we have, the more robust the system will be. Um, the downfall to this is that sometimes you might sample an area where, say, someone is not talking a lot, and that can be uh, like what will be the difference between, say, your system predicting always super confident and having some kind of uncertainty because you might be sampling from an area where maybe there wasn't a lot of speech to begin with. Talking about some preliminary results, uh, I want to emphasize that there very preliminary so far. Um, it, you know, we have the whole pipeline set up. We were able to train and evaluate, and we're getting approximately 90 to 95% accuracy on all the training, validation, and test sets, uh, which is very promising. But this is sort of our first iteration, and we still have a lot of work uh, to really appropriately give some validation metrics. Uh, so one thing that I would like to do, for example, is a series of cross-validations and also uh, sampling from potentially other data sets that are out of distribution or not necessarily these specific recordings just to see how our system is doing. 
Um, so this is kind of our second point. We just recently finished putting proper evaluation for the validation and test, sorry, and the test pipelines. And uh, now we're at a point where we need to both improve our models and get better metrics to really understand both on a per patient level and on a per spectrum level, what's happening, uh, what, when are our models failing? Are they failing because those voice recordings are very hard or are they failing because there's something we're failing to capture? Uh, we're still in the process of figuring uh, a lot of these details out. To translate that, 10% of the time, five to 10% of the time, it's calling a man a woman and a woman a man, or it's saying, I don't know what it is or both? So that's a good question. So um, we'll see in the demo sort of how our evaluation tool works. But so we have this majority vote. So the thing is that our, our vote, while the final result will be male, female, um, you'll actually be able to see the confidence for each. So if you, um, going back to this slide here, uh, I'm taking, let's say, let, let's say for, for this, for example sake, that I'm uh, sampling 20 spectrums for a patient. So 20 times I get a vote. Now, if uh, 19 out of those 20 times, uh, each one of these spectrums gives me like 90%, then I'll be 90% confident that it's a male, more or less. But if throughout this whole thing, let's say it's a voice that's really uncertain, I'm very unsure, then my final vote might be for a uh, female, but it might be with only like 60% accuracy or 55% uh, confidence overall these votes. So it might be just like a, a luck, but in the, at the end, you still have one result coming up, but we're giving this metric as well. Like how much on average did you score? Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but I'll yeah. also show an example of that. So um, one nice thing that we have so far, and keep in mind that this is uh, very much preliminary and a proof of concept for now, uh, we put up a live demo that you can go and use online. So the link is uh, in the slides here. Uh, you'll be, you can already access it. And I put just a few slides to uh, show you how it works. Although it's um, all the information that, uh, that you need is self-contained. It's just if you've never used this particular platform before, uh, there's uh, additional instructions just in case. So we're using Google Colab, which uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Colab, it's uh, uh, Python, Jupyter Notebook environment that you can run directly within your browser. So what that means in this case is that we can write all the code and sort of abstract it and just make it very user friendly and you don't need to install anything on your end. You can pretty much open this and as long as you follow the instructions, things set themselves up automatically and you can run this on your own sound files that you would like to evaluate. Uh, this tool isn't perfect, it's just sort of a, uh, an example. Feel free to use it, feel free to send us some comments, um, and if there's anything that's unclear, let us know. So I'm just gonna walk you through how this works with a sort of few samples, and then I'll actually uh, open it in my browser, fire it up, and show you what it is you should expect when you run this. So this is the page that you see when you first land on this link. Uh, you should probably be signed into Google when you're using, using this, because this is a Google service, so if you're not signed into a Google account, I'm not sure if it'll work. And uh, so the first thing that you want to do is you want to hit these play buttons. So here, when you hover on top of this, you'll see a play button. So you want to first initialize this workstation. So you hit this play, and one, it'll take a bit of time to initialize. That's because it's going to go fetch our code and fetch our model. It's going to install everything locally. Also, Google is going to ask you if you're sure that you want to execute this code because you are executing code uh, from a random stranger, so you should you know, execute this only if you feel comfortable running this. And then once you're done, it'll say uh, it'll say done, and that means that you're done. Step one, which is to initialize this, uh, sort of set up the whole environment. Then what you need to do is uh, click on this icon that you'll see here, and again, these instructions are all going to be in the Colab. And once you click on this icon, you'll be you'll be able to drag and drop files. So you'll be able to upload audio files into your workspace. And uh, so what's that, what that'll look like is you know, sort of like your standard uh, drag and drop, your WAV file will appear here. And once you see that your file is properly added, you can then hit the play button on the analyze voice section, and then it's gonna start running. Um, and once it runs, it'll give you the, uh, it'll analyze the voice, the, the WAV file, uh, and it'll tell you the probability that it was a male's voice and the probability that it was a female's voice. In this case, this was a actual female um, example. So maybe I can do a quick run through of this right now just to see. 
although live demos are rarely a good idea, but uh, let's try it anyway. So I'll just refresh this just so we're sure that I'm not cheating. Um, also, I'll put this in English. For some reason, it defaults to French with me. So first thing is we do is we initialize our workstation. So here it tells you this was not this is not code that is sanctioned by Google. It comes from GitHub. So you know feel free to go from GitHub, look at the code before you run it. Um, so in this case, I'm going to run it. So this might take a little bit of time. I think it takes about uh, maybe 30 seconds uh, to maybe a minute where it downloads all the code. Uh, see, so now, it, so first it actually asks Google for a machine. Google gives you a machine, then it goes, uh, starts downloading all the code, uh, puts the models where they need to be, and then when it's eventually done, it'll just say done. Uh, so let's just wait here for a little bit. I could take some questions as well in the meantime, if anyone has questions. OK, so now we see here that we're done. So uh, we can then go and upload our files. So it says here, click on the folder icon. So here we click on the folder icon. Then you just go to your computer. Uh, you go grab whatever voice file you want to grab. So we'll just use the same one. This is just drag and drop. Uh, so it gives you a little bit of a reminder here. So you just say OK. Uh, so you just wait till it's uploaded. Now we see it here, so it's uploaded. And then you can just go and click this cell here. So analyze voices, click play. And uh, you're going to see a little bit of a status bar here. So see, now it's going to start analyzing the file. And then it should print the results once it's done. I have a question while that's running. Yeah. You, you actually have no idea what is being analyzed because you didn't tell it initially in male and females what to look for. It just collected the data and it might have looked at pitch. It might have looked at all kinds of things, spectrum, but you just have no idea. And so you're not. You, you've done nothing to selectively train it other than give it a file. Uh, that's well. So the one thing I have done is this determining how to actually collect this spectrogram, which is the one piece of information that the machine doesn't figure out for itself is how to convert this file to this spectrogram. But once this gets converted, then yes, you're right. I just say, here are all these examples. Now you figure out what the best way to get the highest score on this data set would be based on only this information. So then let's say Yale and her clinic records some sort of audio, uh, maybe running speech and some vowels. And then I record a completely different um, standardized speech. And I ask the patient to hit their lowest pitch, but Yale never did that. My data will somehow be different then because we didn't do a standardized uh, protocol. Yeah, uh, that's correct. So this is like, this is just deep learning in general. There's this big hypothesis, hypothesis that gets uh, kind of pushed aside all the time is that usually you're sampling from an IID distribution. So what that means is that, you know, you have, uh, you, you make the assumption that your training set and your test sets all are all being sampled from the same distribution. Uh, when you're out of distribution, which is, can happen, um, this will depend on how much data you actually fed your model to generalize to, to just all sorts of data that can be. So, you know, for example, if, if you and, and Yael are recording similar data, but not necessarily the exact same uh, speech, then there's good chances that it will generalize. But if you then take, uh, I don't know, someone singing a song, it's never actually looked at people singing, so that might con confuse the network. So the more data that you have, the more varied your data is, the more robust it becomes because you can evaluate it on more sets. Um, and yeah, it really just learns uh, to find the optimal set of parameters to extract from these spectrograms based on the data it's been trained on. Um, is there any kind of like quality check for your acoustic data? Kind of like, is there any kind of like noise harmonic ratio or did you like record the sounds in a soundproof box? Uh, so the, the data set we trained the computer with is the data set from Patrick Walden. Uh, he's a PhD, PhD speech therapist that uh, collected normal voices from different uh, laryngologists. So, so basically, 
the, the there's no standardized approach. Most people make it from a test lab from laryngologists across. There were six different uh, uh, labs across the U.S., but not standardized. And um, what Jeremy told us before starting this study is that it was even more interesting to have um, data that was not necessarily standardized to better train the computer, as he said before. So uh, when you want to look at vo vocal pathologies, for example, you'll probably want a more standardized uh, way to collect the data. Um, what I have to tell you is that all the data that we use, we um, eliminate all biases like somebody else talking. So the most important bias, of course, is uh, if the um, laryngologist is talking and asking questions. So that was all eliminated. So the, the important bias were eliminated. Say 200 before recordings and 200 after recordings on patients who've had surgery. And I could go to your CoLab Research Google and just run parts of the recording through or all of the recording through it and see what it says out of interest, I guess. That. Yeah, so, so that's the second part of our study we're working on right now. We're actually working um, with a center to uh, run the transgender population through that set. And we're correlating for, um, for other uh, stuff like uh, fundamental frequency and VHI score. So that's the study we're conducting right now. Uh, to see if there's a correlation uh, with the outcomes that we know exist already. So this was the standard set. You haven't actually run any of the transgender patient voices through it yet. Correct. Right now, we've only ran normal voices, and uh, this is what we're doing. Right now, we're starting um, the the study for the transgender population. Yeah, just keep, keep in mind also that um, this is kind of like our first iteration. So it's possible that it doesn't work great right off the bat. Uh, we haven't really validated it on other data other than the data we had. So it is possible that it's not perfect at the moment, uh, but we're going to be revi refining it as we go. But yeah, you can definitely uh, feel free to use the CoLab. And uh, if you do get some some results, maybe just let us know. Like That would be a good data point for us. Like This worked or this didn't work at all. Uh, it would be kind of interesting. And then, you know, do you... Like when I do my recordings, I have a mic on the patient, but I'm across the room, so my voice does get into it. You take your recordings and go in and splice out any talking, or you just had perfect recordings, or yeah. So for for the data we're we're uh, using for transgender patient, we're slicing out any time uh, the physician is talking or the SLP is talking for sure. Um, so that's that's the data we're using, uh, or that we're using retrospectively as, as well. We're using retrospective data and prospective data, uh, yeah. but we're any any other voice contaminant. Did you do any changes in volume on your standard set, or did you do also highest and lowest pitch? Or you, pick, in other words, as a human, if I come up to a person who's in a booth and I want to know if they're male or female, one of the tasks I might do is to ask them to hit their lowest note, e, and that e would be a huge cue, much more than conversational speech. If I just know the lowest pitch that anyone can hit, that one piece of data is really important but you don't train these programs on that one piece of data. It takes the whole spectrum. So uh, if you don't mind, uh, I'll just answer it, uh, this one for clinical reasons. So I think what we're trying to do is, is build um, an outcome measurement for, for, transgender, for the transgender population to see if they're recognized as a male or female when they speak, which right, is the okay. most important psychological outcome for them. And when they speak, usually they speak at a comfortable pitch, right? right? And, and right. that's why we're measuring on, on VHI as well, on, on the TVQ questionnaire, is, is, is do, are they perceived as male or female during conversational speech? Because sure. obviously they don't they don't talk to people trying to reach their lowest pitch or highest pitch, um, so that's why the data we use is at at um, comfortable uh, pitch as well. Um, if I could just add something quickly, um, Dr. Thomas, if if you'd like to upload any um, audio files, it's better if you do it completely independently from what Yale gave us because. It'll be a better indication to if we can generalize to other samples from somewhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. If it works on your data set as well, it's even better. Mm -hmm. So it's better if you just put it without any transformation, record the person. If you want to do the low note, do it and try to upload it and see what it does. Because this is going to help us make it super robust to handle any you know edge cases. Um, Actually, I, need, I just need to add something really quickly. If anyone wants to try to play with uh, the CoLab website, 
Uh, just make sure regarding the extension of the audio file, it's only WAV and MP3s. So if you try to upload something else than those two extensions, it's not going to work. I think with time, we'll, we'll do some quick transformation where you can upload anything, but for now, it's limited to those two extensions. So it sounds to me like if I, if you want to test something, you ideally should then start with a, a data set, a different data set, if you're going to test a um, different part of speech or low and high pitch, you would want your standard data set to include low and high pitch and then and, and re-score that with the machine learning and then put in your question questionable data set. Yeah, so I, ideally you want to have always like a well-guarded test set because the, the, the fear is that uh, so deep learning models in particular are very prone to overfitting data. So the more you can have a robust, properly guarded test set, the more you can be confident that your model didn't just learn to cheat and uh, you know, like memorize patterns, for example. So um, the more varied our test sets uh, or the more uh, difficult these test sets are, the better our evaluation metrics and our confidence that this system actually works uh, will be. And you could then create a data set of having uh, a person breathing air out and, and recording the audio with varying degrees of breathiness and clarity, and it could start to, to, without you telling it to look at high frequency noise or broad spectrum noise, you could just say to it which ones are breathy and which ones aren't, or to what degree of breathiness there is. Could you pick one parameter and set up a data set and then explore just that parameter? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So in the way that we've set up this specific problem, um, it's set up in a way that we're just analyzing gender. So it's a, it's a binary classification, but you could also do um, multiple categories if you had some. So in terms of breathiness, I don't know what the quantitative measure is, but you can also set up your problem in different ways. Uh, you could set up your problem as a regression task, which means that like instead of having a zero or one value, you might have a range of possible values. Uh, so between zero and let's say 100, pick a number in between there, like uh, any any possible number in there. Uh, so it really depends on how you set up your problem. But what to remember is that the main framework is given uh, a sample, what is the target that is associated, and ideally you want as many examples as you can, and as uh, properly or evenly distributed as you can. Well, thanks, Jeremy and Yale, for sharing all this with us. Appreciate it. My pleasure.